Welcome to the Mobile Workforce Podcast, where we sit down and have real conversations with business leaders that have been where you are. During these interviews, we'll dive into what it takes to improve systems and champion processes that maximize performance. Each week, our trailblazing guests share their experiences and understanding of the workforce to help inspire change, challenge our thinking, and share what it takes to successfully travel the road to profitability. Now here's our host, co-founder and chief evangelist of About Time and WorkMax, Mike Merrill. Hello, and welcome to the Mobile Workforce Podcast. I am your host, Mike Merrill, and today we are sitting down with Steve Antill, the CRO at Foundation Software. Steve invests most of his time in building relationships across the construction industry. And uh, one of the things he really focuses on is building those relationships and bridges with companies, sales, marketing, and product development teams. And currently, uh, Steve has over 20 years of experience and has led to more than 1,000 software selections and implementations for contractors of every side and in all different trades. So Steve, before we jump into the conversation today, I wanted to just give you a chance to give us a little bit about your background and maybe share with the listeners what you have learned through your experience in the industry and and maybe some of the places you've been. Thanks, Mike. So I've been with Foundation uh, for 21 years. I started uh, in inside sales, basically talking to contractors uh, to get them lined up to look at our software. I really worked my way up the food chain. It's one of the things we do real well here is uh, we like to develop people over time. So I did inside sales for a while. And then one of the really cool things I did is <clears throat> I'm out of Cleveland, Ohio, but I moved to California back in 2003 and started a West Coast office for us where we were very regional at the time. So it helped put us on the, the map on the West Coast. So I gained a ton of experience because and I was working with contractors on the West Coast and I had some experience with people in the Midwest. So as our company grew from regional to national, I was very much engaged with that. And then in 2011, I came back to Ohio to run sales, director of sales at the company as our company's grown and evolved. I uh, also morphed into uh, business development, maintaining a lot of relationships with industry professionals, accounting firms, CPAs, other vendors in the software space. Um, and, um, you know, we've continued to grow, grow over the years. And uh, now my title is CRO and, uh, you know, sales is underneath me, marketing's underneath me, business development's underneath me. But, you know, very much I still, you know, I, I'm still out there talking to contractors on a daily basis, um, you know, working hand in hand with them, you know, on the sales side and, you know, building relationships with various industry professionals. Wow, that's awesome. Great, uh, great laundry list of experience and uh, appreciate you sharing that. Thanks, Mike. Good to catch up with you guys. Um, you know, we've gone back many years. It's, uh, it's going to be a fun conversation here. So, Awesome. Well, thank you again for joining us. So I, I guess um, just to kind of start out here, one thing um, I'm curious about, and I know you have a lot of experience in this, but what, um, you know, what is it that drives the relationship between uh, construction companies and their suppliers, subcontractors, I and mean, what are those, some of those key things that you see as uh, important? Yeah, it's a, thanks for the question. It's a good one. <clears throat> you know, and from, from our lens, you know, just for full disclosure, 70% of our 5,200 clients are subcontractors. They're very labor intensive. So I tend to approach the world and, and view things more from the subcontractor lens, you know, however we do you know, we have some general contractors, but most of them have labor. So a lot of our clients here at Foundation tend to be, you know, labor intensive trades like electricals, mechanicals, heavy highways, where payroll tends to be a real driving factor in their company, the labor costs, the burden costs. So, you know, some of the things that we see on a daily basis that drives the relationships and, you know, their dealings with other folks, right, would be, you know, if they're doing a government job, uh, working with a general contractor, making sure they're getting their certified payrolls submitted on time, all the contractors on the job are, are getting the right paperwork in. Um, you know, as, as you know, over the years, everything becomes so litigious. Paperwork is, is such a, a big trail. You know, be, being collaborative with the, the generals and the other uh, contractors on the job are real driving factors. Um, making sure they're they're dotting their I's and crossing their T's, so to speak, as far as getting everything submitted and then 
you know, the general is aware of that and, you know, you're, they're even communicating those items back up to, to the owners, the agencies, you know, making sure everybody's uh, working in unison on the project. So that's one thing. And then obviously, you know, on the material side, right, a lot of these folks, you know, especially the ones doing the install work, you know, they're, you know, staying on top of their purchase orders, uh, making sure, you know, uh, their requisitions are getting to the suppliers, making sure those materials are getting delivered to the job in a timely fashion, you know, so they're staying on schedule. And, and again, this is all collaborative, you know, right? These guys are moving around job to job. And, you know, especially now the last, uh, uh, you know, nine to 12 months or, you know, it's going to be coming up over time, you know, making sure they're getting these materials at the job site because a lot of the stuff tends to come from overseas often, mm -hmm. um, you know, staying on schedule, communicating that up with the GC, making sure they're getting their piece done before the next contract, especially the next trade contractor comes in to be their piece. So this stuff is becoming more and more critical, especially due to, to COVID. I mean, you're dealing with suppliers, issues there, you're communicating this back to the generals and, and dealing with all the other trade contractors in between. Yeah, so there, there's a, yeah, lots of different areas and you, um, you kind of mentioned the suppliers, materials, the kind of sticks and bricks, if you will. Yep. Um, that's one side. Um, but there is another side too, and and I think um, you know, I'd be interested in hearing what your thoughts are on how important those relationships are between vendor partners, suppliers, workers, subcontractors, uh, essentially the rest of the, the people that actually have to put those materials uh, and in on a project, install those, deliver them, whatever whatever their role is. I mean, how important do you think it is to have those communications properly set up with with the people? Yeah, right. So essential. I mean, as you're, 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 you're throwing the question my way, I'm thinking essential is, is how I, I'd answer the question, right? And, you know, getting into our world and probably your world, right, these technology pieces have come into the market now <clears throat> that allow everybody to be collaborative and communicate, right? I, I, I think about capturing payroll in the field, getting it submitted, you know, just selfishly within the contractor themselves but collaborating up with the GCs through some of these communication tools through project management systems that they, you know, they're, they're collaborating with their generals and other contractors on and, and even the suppliers, it, it's critical, it's essential. I mean, one delay, you know, one person being off a few hours a day can, can, can throw the, a whole wrench into the process and to, to the job, you know, supplier getting stuff to a job site late can throw, throw a monkey wrench into everything. So, um, you know, I, I mean, think about this. I mean, right, we, we, we've been doing this for a while. So many of probably your clients and our clients, if we walked in their offices a few years ago, they were doing all their scheduling for labor and materials on whiteboards. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, and now there's products out there that they use. And for example, right, we get these great labor scheduling tools that their guys no longer have to manually call in the office and find out where they're going tomorrow, what time they need to be there, what they're working on. They're actually getting a text notification telling them where to be, the supervisor to check in with, you know, who, you know, and same project managers are getting notifications of make sure you're, you're, you know, talking to the general contractor tomorrow, do your safety inspection, make sure all the teams are working in unison. So, right, we're at, we're, we're, we're moving this direction fast now where these unsophisticated contractors that were doing all these things manually from a communication standpoint that even three years ago were essential. Right. Now we're getting to the point where, Everybody's actually being collaborative and working together yeah. and using, taking advantage of these better technologies now. So all that stuff is essential. And you just see a big movement of contractors taking advantage of tools to connect them up with everybody on the job. Yeah, we, uh, we had a, your, your words are resonating with me and um, it's making me think of a guest we had recently on another episode, um, Damian Brothers. And he was talking about how critical it is to have good documentation and how a lot of times um, he just learned that if he wasn't able to document things properly, that it, it wasn't even necessarily worth bringing up the argument or the contention point. So yeah. how important is having that documentation in place and, and where you can use it in this process? I, I love what you just said. If you don't have it, it's probably not worth fighting the battle, right? We hear from our customers, right? You know, the generals, a lot of them, their hearts are in the right place, the subs, their hearts are in the right place, but things go sideways. And so often these jobs have issues with litigation, you know, payments held, you know, it, the, the traditional story you, you, you hear in construction, but you know, there, there's so many great ways to document things. Here's a story that, that I've heard that I really like. There was, 
there, you know, something that didn't exist 10 years ago. There's a software called Unearth. It's designed for heavy contractors hmm. that can document, um, you know, the, what they're basically moving in and out of jobs as far as like uh, dirt loads and things like that. So completely unrelated to what we do or what you guys would do. I really like the story. So there was a, a, a water system that needed work in a city, didn't have time to do a survey. They wanted to get them moving. So their drawings and everything in survey went back to the 1980s and they said, we got to get someone out there to fix it. So this contractor <laughs> won the job. And of course, as the job started, um, you know, the amount of dirt they had to move to fix this dam and water system went up through the roof. And of course, halfway through the job, you know, they were talking to the city saying, we got a whole bunch of change orders coming your way because this is out of scope from what we signed up for. Right. The city said, that's fine. Just, you know, we'll, we're, we're documenting, we're being aware of it. Of course, at the end of the job, they started submitting these, these um, overages. And basically the city said, there's no way you guys move that much dirt. Um, we're not paying you for these change orders. Right. Uh -huh. So typical story 10 years ago, these guys would have ended up in litigation or ended up settling and all that. However, this company uh, subscribed to this product called Unearth, which takes satellite photos of the job site. Wow. And they actually went back, right? You're talking about documentation. They had photos every day of all their trucks coming and going from the jobs because the city's argument was the trucks are only half loaded. They're basically moving half the dirt you're billing us for and all that. And they basically threw it in front of the city's face and said, here's proof. Here's documentation. This is what we truly did. And the city said, you know what? We're right. We're going to pay you. You know, wow. so that contractor by subscribing to a, a system that was documenting things very specific to them and, and their needs, you know, it probably paid for itself multiple times just in that one situation. So, right. I mean, we talk of 20 years ago when me and you got into this, you never heard contractors using tools like that. Now, there's tools like that available to all the different trades, very specific to them, available to the generals. A lot of these are collaborative tools, the GCs and the owners and the subs all use together. And, and it helps the process of keeping jobs moving and it helps avoid litigation between these, these the, the subs and the GCs a lot of times. Yeah, and when you're up, you know, the market right now is so busy, uh, everybody's behind and there's, there's a lot going on uh, with, with some of the other challenges um, the social distancing, the spacing, uh, you can't throw as much labor at things as maybe you used to. And so the last thing you need now is uh, litigation or delays that are external to actually getting something done. Yeah, I mean, right, there's so much uncertainty right now, you know, and these guys are worried about their backlog. And, you know, right, we have clients that from March through May, June, July, a lot of their jobs stopped, started, stopped, started. You know, and right and trying to coordinate all that and getting all the, the, the parties back on the job site at the same time. And then, like you said, right, appeasing all these safety requirements that have come into play now, you know, the, their world's changed. and It's going to be different moving forward if, into 21. So, you know, all these technologies that capture data in the field, documenting, you know, the safety conditions at the job site, incidents and all that. It's, it's just, it, they, in my mind, they easily pay for themselves because so many of them are so fairly priced and reasonable and easy and accessible for even contractors that always thought that stuff was out, you know, out of their range, uh, you know, a few years ago. Yeah, that's very interesting. And I think, you know, like your, like yourself and, and me too, um, we have exposure to so many different contractors and so many different industries and different sizes from little guys to huge guys, publicly traded companies. Um, with that background that you have and that perspective, what do you think some of the biggest challenges are that contractors are facing or trying to solve today? Yeah, you know, I, I come back to the word uncertainty right now. I mean, right, you know, we're, we're living in a moment right now. And, and mm -hmm. you know, we talk to our customers daily over here and right, say people aren't nervous would be lying, right? It's just, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's November 17th when we're recording this. You know, right? I mean, yesterday, Michigan started shutting things down. You know, our company, we have over 150 customers that are active there. And, you know, I, I guarantee in the next couple of days, we'll be talking to some and they'll say certain jobs they are doing are just shutting down. So there's a lot of uncertainty on these jobs. Um, you know, a lot of uncertainty about backlog, you know, beyond the first half of next year for both small and large contractors. Um, you know, that all, and that's going to be changing week in and week out, right? You know, I mean, one of the things we were just talking about today over here is, you know, if there's another stimulus package, you know, 
we're very hopeful there'll be an infrastructure piece in that because that can feed, you know, a large amount of uh, labor and labor and equipment subcontractors for a long time, which would be good for our country. It'd be good for our industry as a whole. But again, until some of this stuff gets done, there's a lot of uncertainty in these contractors' minds. They just, you know, they're, they're very worried for the first time in probably seven, eight years because the economy's booming and just because they're going fast still and they haven't had shutdowns in certain areas, a lot of them are worried what's going to happen late next year and, and, and into 2022. So, you know, that's a, a recurring theme we've been hearing from our clients for a few months is, you know, they just, it's almost like they, they, they you know, they, they just want a clear answer of what's next year going to look like and the year after going to look like. And unfortunately, I don't think with everything going on right now, people have any clue what the next couple months are going to bring. Yeah. Who knows, right? Who knows, right? So, so the jobs you've got in place and that you're on all the more reason to make sure that those run well and are as profitable as possible so that you can control those variables that you do have some control over. Yeah. 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 So it's just, right. It's a different time right now than anything we've experienced in probably the last decade in our industry where things have just been booming nonstop. And even though things look good right now, you know, there's a lot of questions about, you know, what's going to happen, you know, into the future here. So, and I, I think from, you know, both our GC clients and our sub clients and just folks I talk to, you know, if they know they got a strong backlog, you know, they, they, they're comfortable, they'll be more aggressive in what they do. And they'll focus on building their business and taking advantage of tools that'll help their company go to that next level. But, you know, it, it, but when they get uncertain, it just makes them decide often not to do anything. And, you know, they might be missing the boat on things that can help their company because they're fearful of spending money on, on what they might deem as extras. But, there are a lot of tools that could help them on the back end of all this. Yeah. And, and we both know, of course, that in construction, we're kind of known as laggards of adoption of technology. Yeah, completely agree. But, you know, the one thing I tell people is I've been doing this 21 years and I don't have any hard facts on this, but I think our industry, the, the technologies evolved more in the last probably 36 months than the prior 17 years. I mean, it feels like for the first time in doing this that, you know, these contractors are embracing technology um, more so than they ever have. And they're more aware of it, right? And, and, and I don't want to stereotype things, but we deal a lot with small to mid-sized contractors. And I think there's been a little bit of a change in the generations mm. of these companies, right? So mom and dad started the company and ran it to the last few years. And now a lot of times now this newer generation, whether it's the kids or younger leadership and management team, you know, a generation like, you know, uh, Gen X and the millennials are starting to move into these leadership roles. And, you know, you know, we've grown up with technology and computers. And so when we come into these spots and we're looking at the business and saying, why are we not taking advantage of it? Where before it was such a hard sell to get, you know, that generation to like, why do we need this? Why do we need computers? Why do we need technology? Why do we need a mobile solution? We can do it by hand. Now this new generation tends to be hungrier for it where they're like, why aren't we taking advantage of these tools? Right. Yeah, I remember not so long ago, I mean, even a decade ago, companies were saying, you know, I've got all the technology I need in this spreadsheet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that spreadsheet might have been a Lotus spreadsheet, right? <laughs> yeah, true. Good point. Yeah, so. Green screen software. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, just, it's, it's, it's moving quick, yeah. You know, right? I mean, how many... Folks, you know, the first thing they call into us and say is, you know, what cloud solutions do you have, right? 36 months ago, even though many other industries, you know, that was the norm in other industries five, six, seven years ago, you know, construction, it just got on their radar. So when you talk about construction being known as laggers, you know, it took, it, it, it's taken a while to get there, but it just seems like things are moving much quicker right now. Yeah, I, I, it's funny you mentioned that. I was going to ask you how the cloud has impacted what you guys do every day and how often is it now coming up? Yeah, all the time, <laughs> all yeah. the time. You know, and one of the things we even talk about is, you know, we have multiple products over here. We have, you know, we have a mobile system, we have payroll for construction, we have foundation software, you know, the big accounting package. We have thousands of on-premise clients that, you know, over time will move over to our hosted environment and whatnot. But I think a lot of times too, right? A lot of times when people call in, just in, they assume now that what you offer is cloud-based, you know, they just, yeah. you know, they, they just assume what you offer is that option. 
and they wouldn't even consider anything else but a, a SaaS or a cloud option, even if you were still selling on premise. So, um, so right, it's there, you know, it's just it, it's just interesting where you know once you start talking to them, they do start talking about you know cloud and all that. And the one thing that I always talk about with our customers and, and things, and I, you guys may see it too, is I think we're going through this transition right now too, where I'll flat out ask if I'm at World of Concrete or Con Expo, I'll ask the owner of a company, you know, does your company have an IT strategy? Mm -hmm. A lot of times they're like, what are you, what are you talking about? And I, I think we're, we're in that phase now, especially with these small to mid-sized contractors that may be a little bit behind the big, you know, $500 million contractor. You know, mm -hmm. they may use a program like yours, like WorkMax cloud-based, but then they use foundation on-premise version. And then they had an estimating system in for 20 years that, is also on premise and you say, well, what's your, you guys have a goal. Like, are you trying to move all your key programs you need to operate your business to a hosted environment? A lot of times they're like, no, we haven't had the conversation. And I, you know, I'll say, well, maybe it's time you guys, you know, put a roadmap in place where maybe three years from now, you want your work max, you want foundation, you want your estimating system all to be hosted in a, you know, a cloud environment. So you're no longer maintaining that, that infrastructure in your office, you know? So I think we're seeing a little bit of a mismatch now with a lot of these contractors where one or two of their key three or four programs are on-premise and then the other couple are cloud and all that. And, and they're a little bit back and forth. So, you know, it's just trying to educate these guys to sit down and say, you know, do you have a true IT strategy of what you're looking to do with your key, you know, systems you use to run your business on a day-to-day -day basis over the time? Well, so, and, and you mentioned, you know, various systems, various products, how important is integration of those different systems if they've, if they've chosen some best of breed options? Yeah, yeah. So, right, we've, you know, we've gone from import export to API, right? So a lot of times our customers and our prospects we talk to, you know, tell me about your APIs, right? Right out of the gate, that's the first thing. And we say, well, what, what are you looking for? I don't know. I was just told to ask about your APIs. Yeah. So, right, so <laughs> I was going to say, so, they, uh, they didn't used to even know what the word meant or, you know, what the acronym was, you know, referring to, but uh, so it sounds like some still don't, but they know they need it. Yeah, right. So, so we're getting a lot of push from customers, you know, because they no longer want to export from one system and then manually import it in which, you know, to tell you the truth, I mean, that works fine for a lot of folks with certain systems. It just, it, it works fine, but as time goes by, that'll become less and less as, as more API tools get written. So we do have, we do have much more of a demand for APIs now than we did probably 18 months ago, 24 months ago. Um, you know, I'll give you an example. We have a really good relationship with Procore and, you know, obviously, you know, they're the big, big player in the industry right now. So, you know, we've developed API tools with them and, you know, they have a great system, but our average customer is always looking at it from our lens, right? The accounting world and their users doing it from their side, you know, from, from Procore, the operational standpoint, which they do things different than us. And, you know, we get the call all the time is, hey, we want to use these API tools, make Procore and Foundation talk. And we're like, okay, we have these available. So I tell our, our average customer, I'm like, understand the technology part of that is the easy part it's still unifying your team and creating the collaboration between office and operations. So you guys are on the same page of what you want to bring back and forth between the two systems, right? Because if, for example, our accounting folks are so embedded in setting up vendors and accounts payable mm -hmm. because that's a traditional accounting function where a typical Procore user maintains their vendor list in Procore because they're writing POs and subs out of there and all that. And, um, you know, so sitting these teams down to say, okay, you can send vendors from Procore into foundation. How do you feel about that? And the operations team says, that's what we want to do. And then the accounting folks says, no, 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 no. We want to maintain complete control. We want to set the vendors up in foundation and send it to Procore. So our API with them works both ways, their preference. And it's in the technology part, it's the easy part. It's getting their teams to agree of how they want these workflows to go between the two systems um, tends to be the struggle because they just don't see the world from the same lens. Um, but you know, as we get more clients using those API tools and we have continue to have conversations and dialogue with Procore as we share more customers, for example, you know, we're putting better processes in to say, hey, these are best practices other companies have done and this is how these things have worked for you. So yeah. 
Yeah, that's that's interesting how, again, um, I like how you, you said they're looking at it from their perspective in, again, a, a power user in Procore may not be the power user in foundation as no. kind of hearing. Yeah, right, the power user in Procore may not fundamentally understand the flow of accounts payable posting in the general ledger and, and in the job costing, you know, it's completely foreign to them and, and, and all that. And, and a typical accounting manager may not know the complete workflow of how the PMs going through and developing, you know, change orders in Procore. They just, you know, we want the change orders in Procore to talk to foundation. Well, what type of change orders do you want to come back to foundation to update, you know, your, your, your job costing in foundation? A lot of times you're like, I don't know. Well, we need to sit these two teams down together and explain what we can do and, and that. So the technology, again, is the easier part. It's getting those two teams to agree and understand how both systems work and can talk. That tends to be more of the challenge. So, and I, and I think just as a whole in our industry, as more API tools get developed out, you're going to, we're going to continue to, to deal with that system by system, cross each bridge one at a time, you know, especially like, you know, we have an API tool with uh, pro West estimating software. And we just had a client last week, really good longtime client that started asking for more things than the API offers. And, and, you know, pro us like, it'd be nice if you guys did this. And we started looking at it and we're like, I don't even know if this logically makes sense. And what the estimator wanted to do doesn't really make sense in our system. So we got them together on the phone, all three of us, and kind of talked through it. And then they were kind of like, oh, you're right. There would be no point in doing that, even though he thought that could be something that would benefit their client. It's just not something that happens in the accounting side. So again, another example where different departments see the world from different lenses. Yeah. And I think, you know, you're I mean, I, I'm having flashbacks of so many conversations that I've had. In fact, even just a couple of weeks ago, we had a, a new client um, and they're in kind of the mining and energy space okay. and in a big room with eight or 10 people. And depending on what feature or function we were talking about, different people around that table said, oh, no, 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 no. I don't even care about that. What I need is and then yet somebody else would say, well, no, 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 that's critical. We have to have that. And so uh, to your point, um, we've got different focuses for different people depending on what their role is. And, and I think APIs and having a, a workflow process that, that lets these systems work together to maximize the options of possible touch points is something we can do as technology vendors. But it, at the end of the day, um, software is only good if it's used by its users. So that's kind of a, a gap that I think we have to do a better job leading people to try and fill. I like what you said there, you know, um, in that example, I, you know, you said, I do not need that, or I do not want that, you know, right. So again, a lot of times, one of the things that I've seen, seen exist in our industry for so many years, at least since I've been in it is, you know, the, these, teams work in silos, right? Accounting, field, mm -hmm. estimating, they work in silos and right, as good as companies like you're doing developing APIs and we're doing developing APIs like the one we have with Procore, you know, at the end of the day, we're still in a people business. And I always reflect back at, to, to Fred Odie, you know, our founder, you know, I remember probably in the year 2000, he said, if you can connect the field and office and get them talking together, you'll be a millionaire overnight. And looking back on this, the truth is you, you would have been a multimillionaire overnight because, yeah. you know, they, they, they work different from each other. And there's been a, a traditional disconnect between those business units for so many years. And these API tools are great that we can bring them together. But at the end of the day, we're still in the people business, getting people to sit around that table and, and, and capitulating on certain things and making sure organizationally as a whole, they're all in alignment and what they're trying to achieve. And I think once you cross that bridge, which I think for the first time in our industry, we're doing more of now than we've ever have, then these companies are effectively utilizing, you know, all these tools together the correct way. But at the end of the day, right, we're in a people business. If you can't get the different departments to change their behaviors, as great as these tools are, chances are they're not going to work for them. So. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. So, so you're, um, you're with foundation soft, which is, essentially a construction job cost accounting solution. Is that 
define properly? A, yeah, it's a great way to define it. You nailed it. So what? So tell me, with that definition, uh, what what is that? What does that even mean? Say I'm on QuickBooks or something, you know, more simple, not as specialized. What does that mean? Jo true job cost accounting. Right. So, so I'll give you the salesman answer and then we can drill down a little bit, right? Okay. So an easy way to approach this is, you know, we've made our living as a company at, you know, foundation software, you know, we've, we love QuickBooks. Um, without QuickBooks, we probably wouldn't exist because QuickBooks is such a great starter software for general businesses. And right, just like anyone else, a construction company starting off finds their way to it more often than not. So right, right. You know, we, we, in, in the companies we market to, you know, we believe there's probably over 100,000 construction companies that could use our product that just that use QuickBooks around the United States. So, right. So there's just a tremendous amount of businesses that use QuickBooks. Um, millions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Millions and, hundred, and probably 100,000 between 3 million to 25 million commercial yeah. construction companies that we're chasing. Um, so so what what happens a lot is they're going they, they, they often run their business like a, a check register, right? It's all cash based, mm -hmm. paying their bills, all that type of stuff. And then they grow up a little bit and get a, a job that's bigger than anything they've had. And, you know, they tend to start with tracking things by labor, material, subs, equipment costs, other. And then they start growing and, and, and doing well. And then they may say, hey, we want to put a, a coding structure in place. You know, and if you're an electrical contractor, it might be conduit, fixtures, lighting. Within that, mm -hmm. then you look at labor, material, sub cost. But what happens is, you're building these layers of job cost. It's kind of just organically happening as your company's growing and maybe you're taking on bigger commercial jobs or bigger government jobs. Um, and then, you know, a couple of things start happening. You know, you start becoming inefficient where you're doing your reporting in Excel, right? We were talking about spreadsheets a few minutes right. ago. You're doing all your, your, what you deem is job cost reports in Excel, but there's no real source of truth of that. It's just numbers that are gathered and plugged into a spreadsheet where maybe you're saying, hey, we think the estimated cost is 100,000 and our reports in QuickBooks says actual cost right now is 80,000, right? So you're manually plugging the stuff in it. So things do not reconcile back to accounting. So a couple of things that happen on the tipping point, we start seeing these contractors maybe hit 3 million, 4 million, $5 million where the burden of, of, of doing that manually, the behavior of it, it's a tipping point where they're like, wow, we're not being efficient. Maybe we should start looking at something industry specific, you know, a construction accounting package. One mm -hmm. of the other indicators are the CPA comes in there, they have a good CPA and says, guys, you're, you're spending way more in labor doing this stuff manually versus if you were to get a construction specific job cost accounting system that would automatically build these reports for you. So that's another one. Then the one that's really, you know, interesting is the bonding company. You know, these, uh, you, you know, the company hits three million, five million. They go to bid on a larger job, and they, you know, want to increase their bonding capacity. And the bonding agent says, you, you, "This data you're sending me is in spreadsheets. They're, it reconciles back to nothing. We're having a hard time accepting this data as a source of truth from you." So, right, there's a lot of moving pieces that mm -hmm. can't happen. Um, but, but the natural evolution is at some point, probably between 3 million on up is these companies find their way into starting to think about getting into what, you know, you're calling a job cost accounting system. You know, I call it a fully integrated job cost system where if conceptually they're using us or there's other products we compete with correctly, they're entering data into accounts payable, they're entering it into the payroll module or they're using your system and capturing payroll in the field and it pushes into our payroll module and they're doing their billing functions in AR. And the beauty of the seamless, fully integrated job cost accounting system is, is they're putting those transactions in to those daily modules. They're capturing the job and the, and the job cost structure that they're going to. And then when they post those transactions, it's fully integrated. It updates the root accounting module, just like it would in QuickBooks. It also hits your ledger, but it also automatically takes that and pushes it into the job cost system. So again, they're no longer manually plugging numbers into a, a spreadsheet. They're in a fully integrated job cost construction accounting package. You know, and, and, and you know, two reports right out of the gate they should be getting with us or any of the other systems out there would be estimated versus actual cost to, to see within a job estimated versus actual cost. So you know, if they're doing that and getting that automated, 
that's a huge step up from manually doing it in spreadsheets. And then the other big one is the one that relates to the bonding company. They're starting to formulate an over under billing report where they can see a percentage of completion on the job or even broken down by the, the, the cost code within the job. You know, and then these companies hopefully will do more with that. They'll start forecasting off of it and, and you know, using it to their advantage to start growing their business. So, Yeah, it sounds like you've got a lot to offer uh, smaller to mid-sized organizations that are really trying to get, get a handle on those true costs on a regular daily basis and head into growth. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's you know, we, that's, we want to help these, these folks. And if, you know, if they go through training and they set the system up to, to be used at a basic to mid, mid level, it's a huge improvement from QuickBooks and, and, and it should give them information to help them make better business decisions, you know, adjust during the life cycle of the job. You know, you're talking about those spreadsheets, right? So often these numbers are not getting updated in the spreadsheet till the job's done right. and it's over. You can't react where if you're on a daily, weekly basis, looking at real-time job costing, you can, you can make adjustments on the job on the fly and, and you know, increase the profitability. That's great. Great advice. Um, so kind of uh, winding up here a little bit, um, just curious, what would you advise companies, whether they're large or small, uh, that they should be doing here as we wrap up 2020 to, to give themselves an advantage and be a better position for 2021? Yeah. So, you know, we were talking about the emergence of technology a little bit and, and maybe how it also trickles down from larger contractors to smaller. I think these guys are going to have to be nimble, willing to adjust, be flexible more probably in 2021 than they've had to be the last, you know, decade just because of all, everything going on in the world. Um, the one thing that's really starting to emerge quickly that I think it's a great topic is, is these business analytical tools, like using the power BIs of the world, right? Four years ago, a typical $30 million foundation client or about time or work max client wasn't even, these weren't on their radar. Now we're starting to see clients use these tools. And I think this could be a separator, you know, with the small to mid-sized contractors, the big guys are using these now, mm -hmm. but, you know, on top of getting good reporting out of, out of them, they're allowing contractors to do predictive analysis jobs, which I think moving into 2021 can be big and it can be important, right? You know, help, helping to predict things like cash flow, right? Cash flow is going to be an issue that comes up more probably more in 2021 than it has the last few years because a lot of these guys have been doing very well, you know, and all that. And now that, you know, the margins might be down, the schedules might be off, you know, starting to look at some past history to help make predictive analysis and decisions on jobs and being able to adjust on the fly. So it's one of the things that's just real interesting, like, you know, a year or two ago, very few of our clients were using these tools, even asking us about them. And now we're, you know, on a daily basis, you got companies that are just, hey, we use Power BI. You know, we want to pull data from your system into Power BI and build some reports off of that. That's going to help predict, you know, type of jobs we should be bidding on, cash flow cycles within different types of jobs we do. You know, right? They don't, you know, if cash flow might be tight, there might be certain types of jobs it takes a long time to get paid on. And they can, you know, do some predictive analysis on that. And then even though the job could be profitable, it might hurt them next year or during the life cycle of the job because those type of jobs may take longer to get paid on. So those are all things I think contractors should be thinking about. And again, these tools are readily available and they're very affordable. I mean, you can use Google Data Studio. I mean, you got clients, big companies that use uh, Tableau. That's mm -hmm. become very popular as well. But, you know, again, it's just fascinating to me because contractors we have that didn't have this on their radar in any way, shape, or form a year or two ago. It's kind of cool. They call in and say, hey, Steve, we're starting using Power BI. You know, we want to talk to you guys about doing some consulting, get foundation married into it. And then, you know, and then they're bringing data in from other systems as well, bringing multiple systems data together. So. Yeah, it's nice to see, really um, nice to see the advancement of technology in our industry and, and people embracing it as, as opposed to running away from it like they've done in the past. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a different game, isn't it? It's cool. It's really cool. It's awesome. Well, so um, just to, to wrap up, one question I like to ask all of the guests of the podcast, what's one hack or kind of process or um, kind of a secret sauce that Steve Antill has learned over your illustrious multi-decade career? 
Um, all right. So I may, may be living in the moment right now, but you know, I mean, you know, I run a team of about 15 salespeople and, okay. and uh, you know, we have a, a, a marketing department over here. You know, I, I, I think sometimes I need to step back and a good thing in secret sauce is, you know, it's a, it's, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint, mm-hmm. you know, as we go through things. And I think, right. This year is a good example of it where, you know, I, it's, it's probably not a wise decision to make business decisions on what's happening this week or on the election until we know what the fallout is to overanalyze sales even this month versus over a broader period of a time. So, you know, sometimes when we're looking at the business as a whole and, you know, even talking about our customers and how they do things, you know, it's, it's, it's a marathon. If you're committed to your business and you want to be in this for the long haul, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint, you know, it, it, take your time, be patient. Sometimes, you know, I was telling my 11 year old son the other day, you know, sometimes the best decision you can make in life is no decision. Like if you're unsure of what you're going to do, you know, maybe doing nothing is, is better than, than doing something that you're unsure of, you know, because he's, he's 11 and there's something he wants and he's not sure he has enough money and, you know, <laughs> and he's, he wants to, you know, so I was like, listen, if you're not sure that's what you want, save your money, do nothing. And then maybe in another month, if you still want it, spend your money on it. You know, there's, there's no mm-hmm. rush. So, so, so yeah, it's, it, I, I think, it's not a sprint, you know, it's, it's, it's a marathon and, you know, we're in this for the long haul. I'm this for the long haul. I think a lot of our clients are as well. And, you know, let's just take a step back and, and take three deep breaths and just kind of see what the next little bit brings to us. And, you know, and from a leadership level, you know, passing that down to our team. So everybody's not reacting to things so quickly right now is only a good, good thing. No, that's great. I think it's great for not only business, but personally, uh, good advice and wisdom there. Thank you. So, thank you. Well, again, thank you for joining us today. Um, we're uh, always, always excited to have these great conversations, and this has been certainly no exception to that today. Thank you, Mike. I really appreciate being on the, the podcast. Thank you. You bet. So, thank you for joining us today on the Mobile Workforce Podcast, sponsored by About Time Technologies and WorkMax. If you like the conversation Steve and I had today and we're able to get some tidbits or helpful information that you enjoyed and can implement, please give us a rating and a review on your favorite podcast platform. And remember to follow us on Instagram at workmax underscore, and we'll catch you on the next one.